In this problem, we're going to investigate time division multiplexing. And just to make things kind of concrete, we're going to just kind of arbitrarily pick 14 users and then do a, a variety of computations for this kind of toy TDM ex example. We're going to let the ith user, so we have i equal 1 to 14, have a message of the form m i of t. So user 1 sends signal m1 of t, user 2 sends signal m2 of t. That's the time domain representation of the signal they're wanting to transmit. In the frequency domain, we call that capital M, I of F. So we have M1 of F, M2 of F. Those are the Fourier transforms or the frequency domain representation of these signals. And what we're going to do is we're going to assume that all of these signals are essentially the same. In the frequency domain, they're a triangle function with a total width of 7,000. So even though they're all different users just for the sake of this problem, we'll assume that their spectrums are all the same. We'll also assume that all of their powers are the same. So every user has the same amount of power p sub i, and just for concreteness, we're setting that equal to 2. We're going to take these user signals, all 14 of them, we're going to sample them. We're going to encode them using pulse code modulation. So when you do that, you take a sample, you quantize it, and you write it down as a sequence of pulses. And then these pulses are going to be time division multiplexed together. So we're going to take 14 individual data streams, sample them, encode them to bits, which we'll represent as pulses, and then those pulses will get mixed together into one large or giant data stream using time division multiplexing. Obviously, to keep track of where all the user data is, we're going to have to add framing bits. You know, once we mix all these things together, we need to know where user 1's bits are, where user 3's bits are, and things like that. So we're going to need to have some type of framing bits so at the receiver, the receiver can figure out the individual user bits. So that's kind of the, the problem setup. In part A of this problem, we're going to compute the Nyquist rate of the individual user signals. So M I of T is the individual user signal. We know in the frequency domain that's represented as MIFF, which we said was a triangle function. So if we sketch what this looks like, it's going to look like a triangle centered at zero with a total width of 7,000. So that means it goes from minus 3,500 to 3,500 for a total width of 7,000 hertz. And computing the Nyquist rate for this user is very easy because the Nyquist rate is always just twice the largest frequency. So we can look and find the largest frequency, which we call F max. F max is 3,500. So 2 times 3,500 is 7,000 hertz. So for each user, we need to sample their signal at a rate of 7,000 times per second. So when we do the sampling in this TDM scheme, each user will be sampled at a rate of 7,000 hertz. In the second part, let's go ahead and assume that we've properly configured our quantizer. So we said we're going to sample and then encode using pulse code modulation. So to do that, we need to quantize each of these samples to a fixed level. That's what a quantizer does. A sample value is usually going to be a continuous valued value, and we need to round it off to the nearest quantizer level. The notation that we use in this class for how we describe quantizers is with this parameter called MP, and that basically describes the upper and lower limits of the signal that you're going to be sampling and quantizing, and then the quantizer levels are filled in between plus and minus MP. So these blue lines here represent what the quantizer levels are, and then the signal that I'm sampling always fits nicely inside of the quantizer levels. So by saying I assume that I'm, quote, properly configured, I'm assuming that I've stretched out MP to encompass these signals properly and that I'm not clipping anything. I also have set up the quantizer levels to span the, uh, the signal nicely so I'm not you know, using too many levels or needing more levels. So one of the things we're going to do here is we're going to figure out how many bits per sample that we need. And this is a big design trait here. The more samples I use or the more bits that I use per sample, the less quantization error that I introduce, but the more data I have to transmit. So when I'm asked how many quantizer bits do I need for a certain signal-to-noise ratio, we're talking about quantization signal-to-noise ratio. So we can actually do this computation very easily. There's a nice little equation that tells us exactly how many signal levels we need or how many bits that we need per sample to achieve a certain quantization SNR. And it's written in terms of 
the desired SNR, in this case 40, the number of quantizer levels L, the number of, or the number MP, which is how we've spread these quantizer levels out, and then also PM, the power of the message. So this equation right here is an equation you can use to solve for the number of levels if you know what your desired SNR is, what your message power is, and how you've set up your quantization levels spaced between plus and minus MP. So for this problem, we know what P is, we know what M is, so we can actually rearrange this and solve for L. If I move to the 10 to the other side, and then take the exponent to the power 10, and then take the square root to isolate L, I can rearrange this equation in terms of L. So I would have L equals the square root of 10 to the fourth, divided by 3, that's the 3 that got moved to the other side, times mp squared over p sub m. This is what I would obtain after I had done that algebra to isolate L. And now we can go ahead and just plug in what we know for this problem. We know that we have our quantizer set up with mp equal 3, so I have a 3 squared. And I also have each power is equal to 2. So after I plug this in, I get the number 122.5. So if I solve for this equation, I get the real valued quantity L equals 122.5. Now we can't have a quantizer with a fractional number of levels. So typically what we do is we'll take this number and we'll raise it to the next power of 2. So the next power of 2 is 128. So we are going to use 128 quantizer levels. 128 quantizer levels needs 7 bits. 2 to the 7 is 128. So to achieve a quantization signal-to-noise ratio of 40 dB, I'm going to use 7 bits for every sample that I take for this problem. By doing this, I'm actually going to have an SNR that's just a little bit better than 40 dB, because we actually rounded it up. If I'd used 122.5, I would have had an SNR of exactly 40 dB, but we're using a little bit more than that, so we'll actually have an SNR that's slightly better than 40 dB. But I need 7 bits per sample. All right, now we know how often we're sampling each signal. We're sampling each signal at 7,000 samples per second. Each one of those samples we're going to write down as a 7-bit word. Let's do some final calculations here. Instead of sampling at exactly the Nyquist rate, we're going to go ahead and sample just a little bit over. We're going to sample at 1.2 times the Nyquist rate. And we're also going to quantify specifically how much framing bits are going to add to our system. Remember, the framing bits are what are used at the receiver to kind of dig out individual data streams. So with these numbers we can now compute what the total data rate of the TDM system is. So by the TDM system we mean all 14 user signals aggregated into one data stream. What is the data rate of that signal? So we can do that computation fairly easily. It's kind of just a unit analysis problem at this point. We have 14 users and each user is being sampled at 7,000 samples per second times 1.2, because we're oversampling a little bit. 7,000 was the Nyquist rate, but we're told right here in problem C that we're going to sample at 1.2 times it. So each one of those samples we write down as a 7-bit word. So 14 users times 7,000 samples per second times 1.2 times 7 bits per sample. And then finally, multiply by 1.04 to account for the fact that whatever my initial data rate is, I have to add on 4% more in framing bits in terms of overhead. So if we do the unit analysis here, we see that users cancels. We see that the units of samples cancel. And what I'm left here is a unit of bits per second. And that's what data rate is. Data rate is bits per second. If I multiply all this out in my calculator, we will get 856,128 bits. Per second. So this is the data rate of the entire TDM system. And now finally for part D, let's talk about how we might actually transmit that data rate. We have a big choice to make in the pulse that we use to represent the, the bits. I'm going to send a, a positive pulse for a binary 1 and a negative pulse for a binary 0. What pulse should I use to represent those bits? The smaller the pulse, the larger it is in the frequency domain, so the more bandwidth I'm going to need to transmit this data. So what is the best I can do to transmit this TDM signal? What's the least amount of bandwidth that I would ever need to transmit this signal? 
So we know that our data rate is 856,128 bits per second. We have a rule that if we have 856,128 bits per second, I'm going to need half the bandwidth if I use the optimal pulse. And by optimal pulse, in this context, we're talking about in optimal in terms of bandwidth. And the optimal zero interference pulse, or zero ISI pulse, one that interferes with its neighbors at in none, ISI is intersimple interference. So the optimal pulse in terms of bandwidth that has no interference with its neighboring pulses is actually a sync function. So we need to transmit 856,128 pulses per second, and the optimal pulse to use is a sync, and its bandwidth is going to be the rate over 2. So this is something we talked about in the lecture, and we just know that the optimal 0 ISI pulse always has R over 2 bandwidth. In this case, R is 856, 128. So if we divide by 2, we get 428, 0, 64. So the best I could ever do, the minimum amount of bandwidth I would ever need to transmit this signal at this data rate would be using this sync pulse, and it would require 428,064 hertz of bandwidth. Now we also talked about in class how this pulse is somewhat impractical because it exists from time minus infinity to infinity, but this at least does give us a kind of a lower bound on the, the optimal minimum bandwidth we'd ever need when doing binary signaling with the constraint that we have to have zero ISI. Okay, so that wraps up this problem. It's basically kind of a toy problem, 14 users and some kind of some contrived data rates and sampling rates and framing overhead and whatnot, but some basic calculations to show how you can figure out kind of aggregate data rates and then a theoretically minimum bandwidth you would need to transmit that aggregate TDM signal.